I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Please call the roll. Monica Duran. Here. Zachary Urban. Present. Janice Hoppy. Present. Tim Fitzgerald. Here. George Pond. Present. Larry Matthews. Here. And um, Madam Mayor, C Christy Davis excused herself for this evening, and I have not heard from Genevieve Wooden. She may have e emailed me after 515, but I haven't seen, I haven't opened my computer she had since then, me so. And I, I forwarded that to you last week. Okay. Thank you. Are there any changes to the council minutes of June 12th or the study session notes of June 19? If none, they stand approved as presented tonight. Now, we're going to, we don't have really a proclamation and ceremonies, but we have a, an announcement here announcing that the first opportunity for public input on the 218 budget. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read this. It's not really an item. And then maybe staff has a comment. The issue is the process for the development of the 218 budget is underway. It's an important phase of this process, which is offering the public opportunity to provide input to the city council prior to the presentation of the 218 proposed budget. The public input opportunity is the first of two the second opportunity for public input will be during the regular city council meeting on Monday, August 4th. Um, maybe, do we have anyone who would like? Uh, yes. Heather Geyer. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just want to reiterate the importance of citizen engagement during the bu uh, budget process. So we have kicked off 2018. We always seek input from citizens prior to presenting the proposed budget to City Council. So they have an opportunity to come forward and make com comment on what their priorities are as community members, uh, best practice within local government budgeting. Once we have the proposed budget prepared, we'll make it available online. We'll also update our different um, interactive budgeting tools that we've added over the the past couple years, including Balancing Act, our Socrata software. So um, we will be providing council with the proposed budget before Labor Day. So after the Labor Day ho um, holiday, then citizens can expect to be able to go online and download a copy of the proposed budget then. All right, so it'll be online after Labor Day. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we can move on to our meeting now, starting with the consent agenda. Councilmember Duran, would you read that for us? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Madam Mayor, we, you probably should ask if there is anybody in the, in the, in the chambers that would like to, to have any comments on the budget yeah, first. Yeah, I do have notes here. Let's see if I have anybody here. And we do. Uh, and I thank you for that. Um, Paul Ballager. Looks like, well, it's rigid 38, bike, ped. I don't but know. These are all citizens' right to speak. I, I realize that. that. Oh, okay. um, yeah, I, this is in regard to the 2018 budget? No, it's not. Okay. Yes, and I did call you, and that was because I first I thought that's what it said. So please wait, and uh, we will have an open seat. Well, actually, we do here, very close. Let me pull this together here. We are going to move on to the citizens' right to speak. So, Paul, right now, and please give your address, name, and address. Okay. So, my name is Paul Balliger. I'm from Boulder, Colorado. Um, I'm the race director for the Ridget 38 Criterion Bicycle Race. We just had our fourth annual race uh, about four weeks ago here in Wheat Ridge. Um, it was a huge success. Um, it's become a favorite on the racing calendar with racers. Uh, it includes a brew fest and an artisan and farmer's market as well now. Um, and I came by tonight to, to say that the success that we have with this race is due in large part to the assistance that we get from the city of Wheat Ridge and the people that work with us from the city. 
Um, I want to specifically mention several people. Um, the police department is enormously helpful. Mike Hendershot leads those efforts. Um, Public Works and Jim Kiley have been a great assistance to us. Um, the engineering department, Steve Wynn, do a great job working with us on traffic control. Um, the folks at uh, Local Works um, who coordinate the event um, are outstanding. Jenny Snell is here tonight. She'll be talking about other matters. Um, but Britta Fisher, Carolyn Duran, uh, Ashley Holland, and Chelsea Bunker all do outstanding work on this. Um, and I just want to add, I've got extensive experience coordinating events. I directed Ride the Rockies for 22 years. I've worked with cities hosting the US Pro Challenge. Um, and so as director of Ride the Rockies, I've worked with over 100 jurisdictions in the state of Colorado. And, and I, I know that people come here, stand at this very microphone, and give you an earful when they have something to complain about. But I came tonight to tell you that really the assistance that we get putting on this event from the city of Wheat Ridge and the employees, the staff of the city of Wheat Ridge is second to none. It's really outstanding. And I just came to say thank you very much. And if you had questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But if not, that's all I had to say. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have Jenny Snell here next for Bike Ped Master Plan. Jenny, were you going to speak at that issue, which is at the end of the meeting? Now, it's at the end of the meeting. Would, would you like to do that now, or would you like to wait till the end of the meeting? All right, that'll be fine. And then I have Rachel Hultine on a policy matter. Rachel. Good evening. My name is Rachel Hultine, and I live at 4690 Balsam Street in District 2. And I'm here tonight to uh, invite everybody to two events that are happening in the next couple of weeks. One's actually happening on uh, Wednesday night. Is that right, Jenny? The Activate 38? Yeah. Um, so Wheat Ridge is a recipient of a Kaiser Permanente grant. It's a planning grant to improve, a improve access for people who want to walk, ride a bike, and wheelchair roll on 38th Avenue west of Kipling. We, every month, have a community meeting so that we can get community input in terms of what's important to them as far as improvements that should be prioritized on the corridor. Our next meeting is this Wednesday, and I have to keep looking at Jenny because she's the corridor. It's, it's at 6, 6.30 at the Lutheran Church. Yep, at the Glory of God Church on West 38th. Um, we invite everybody to come in the community. It's actually a, a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about the planning process, and we're gonna be talking about an event in September that's gonna be a tactical urbanism pop-up event that will demonstrate what's possible on the corridor for one day. So we hope everyone will join us there. And then the next event is on July 26th at iPie Pizza, which is at about 38th and Fenton, I believe. Sorry, I should have had my address as I ra raced over here. Um, it is a really fun community event called Pites and Policy. And uh, what we do is talk about um, what are the things in our community that we make decisions about um, and how can we as citizens be more engaged and informed. And it's a great opportunity to um, meet your neighbors, have meaningful conversations about things that are important in our community. The last one, Patrick Goff was our, our guest speaker and talked um, a little bit more about the city budgeting process. Uh, our theme is why can't we have nice things? And we're gonna be addressing what it takes to convert a corner into something nice. And uh, there, it's pints and policy, so there's beer at IPI. And then we have a couple of custom card games that we've designed just for Wheat Ridge. Um, I think a lot of you in this room have actually played some of them. They're really fun. And so we hope everyone will be there. That starts at seven o'clock on July 26th at IPI Pizza. Thanks. Thank you. I don't believe we have any more speakers. Are there any changes in tonight's agenda? Seeing none, we'll go forward. Now we'll go and read the consent agenda, Ms. Duran. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Consent agenda 1A, motion to approve the purchase of snow and ice control equipment from Auto Truck Group of Colorado Springs, Colorado, in the amount not to exceed $98,708. Item B, motion to award a contract for bus shelter and bus bench cleaning and snow 
and Refuge Removal Services to United Facility Solutions of Littleton, Colorado in the amount not to exceed $40,000. A motion in order. There's a motion, please. Motion to approve the purchase of snow and ice control equipment from Auto Truck Group of Colorado Springs, Colorado, in the amount not to exceed ninety-eight thousand seven hundred and eight dollars. I move to approve the purchase of snow and ice equipment from Auto Truck Group of Colorado Springs, Colorado, in the amount not to exceed ninety-eight thousand seven hundred and eight dollars. Cast your votes. Is it Tim? Is Tim, you were the second. Okay. Yeah. Motion carries six to zero. Okay, more well, item, item. Yes, item B. Oh, you broke them up into two different. I did. I see. I did. All right. Since there since were just we, two. Okay, then go ahead and give us another uh, motion in a second. Okay, item B. I move to award a contract for bus shelter and bus bench cleaning and snow and refuse removal services to United Facilities Solution LLC of Littleton, Colorado in the amount not to exceed forty thousand dollars. Second. Second by Ms. Hoppy. I have a question on that. Discussion on that? Um, how far on either side of the bus shelters does that contract extend or what is the the sort of radius of that uh, cleaning go or, or how do we determine the sort of the parameters of that do we know Thank you, Councilmember Urban. Uh, the services here for the bus shelter cleaning and snow removal are, are pretty much just the immediate um, area around the shelter itself, the trash cans there, and then we do some snow removal there around the shelter, but it's pretty much just right there at the shelter. And is it, um, is it done in cooperation with the city so there isn't some sort of situation where the city's pushing snow back onto that shelter or a situation where we're sort of doubling up efforts or? Right, that, that's correct, yeah. The contractor is, is uh, responsible for removing the snow off the site, and then as our plow drivers go by, they're careful not to um, have to redouble the efforts there, correct? And uh, so why isn't, uh, is RTD involved in this in any way, or is it our responsibility to do the, the, the specific uh, bus shelter cleaning? These are our responsibility. Okay, all right, thank you. We can go ahead and cast our vote then, please. Motion carries six to zero. Thank you. Councilmember Hoppy, please read item number two. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Council Bill number 10 2017, an ordinance approving the rezoning of property located at 6610 West 31st Avenue from residential 2R2 to residential 1C R1C, case number WZ 17 02 Gustafsson. At issue, the applicant is requesting approval of a zone change from R2 to R1C for property located at 6610 West 31st Avenue. The proposed rezoning area includes one parcel, the total size of which is approximately a third of an acre. The current R2 zoning allows for a duplex, but the smaller minimum lot established by the proposed R1C zoning will allow the property to be subdivided into two parcels. The subdivision and rezoning will allow for construction of two homes. The Planning Commission heard the request at a public hearing on May 18, 2017, and recommended approval. Thank you. I do need an ordinance number on this. This will be ordinance number 1622. Thank you. I'm opening the public hearing, and I need to swear in anybody who will be testifying. If so, please stand up, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth as you know it to be? If so, say I do. Thank you. And now please go ahead and give us a report from staff. Nobody's on the call. We got one week. Good evening, Council. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. 
Uh, for the record, Zach Wallace Mendez. I'm a planner with the Community Development Department. Um, I would like to enter into the public record the contents of the case file, the zoning ordinance, the comprehensive plan, and this digital presentation. The property is within the city of Wheat Ridge. All pro appropriate notification and posting requirements have been met, and therefore city council does have jurisdiction to get the case. Um, as was mentioned, the case was a request for approval of a zone change from residential two to residential one C on property at 6610 West 31st Avenue. The property is shown here in red uh, at the southwest corner of 31st and Newland. Uh, this is the same aerial that you just saw with the zoning map laid over it. Uh, as you can see, the property is in a heavily residential area, currently zoned R2 um, with some R1, R1C, R1A kind of mixed around there as well. This is an excerpt from the comprehensive plan. Uh, the property is situated uh, in an established neighborhood and is denoted as such in the comprehensive plan. Um, this designation envisions residential uses consistent with the current residential neighborhood. Uh, there was a neighborhood meeting held in March. Seven neighbors were in attendance. Uh, no one has contacted, contacted city staff during the public noticing period for this hearing. Uh, referral utility agencies and other city departments responded with no comments or concerns to the request. If the zone change is approved, uh, the applicant will need to work with the building division in order re to receive proper building permits. That would be the next step. Um, and Planning Commission did hear this case at a public hearing on May 18th, and they recommended approval. Staff recommends approval of this zone change um, because it does meet the zone change criteria. Um, there's an extensive analysis in uh, the staff report included in your packet, um, but I'll quickly summarize the conclusion. Uh, staff finds that the proposed zoning is supported by the comprehensive plan. The proposed zoning is compatible with the surrounding area. Uh, the Planning Commission did recommend approval of the zone change. That concludes my quick presentation. I'd be happy to answer any more in-depth questions that you may have. Council, this is a time if you'd like to ask questions of staff. I don't hear any. I don't believe we need application testimony. I don't have any public comment when you know, nobody has requested to comment, so we're gonna keep moving along. And I'm gonna close the hearing. And I'm gonna ask for a motion. Ms. Hoppy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> I move to approve Council Bill Number 10-2017, an ordinance approving the rezoning of property located at 6610 West 31st Avenue from Residential 2 R2 to Residential 1C R1C on second reading and that take effect 15 days after final publication for the following reasons. One, City Council has conducted a proper public hearing that meets all public notice requirements as required by Section 26-109 of the Code of Laws. Two. The requested rezoning has been reviewed by the Planning Commission, which has forwarded its recommendation of approval. And three, the requested rezoning has been found to comply with the criteria for review in Section 26-112.E of the Code of Laws. Second. Seconded by Ms. Duran. Any discussion? Please cast your votes. Motion carries. Five to one with Council Member Matthews voting no. Mr. Urban, would you like to read item number three for us? Thank you. Uh, Council Bill number 11 2017, an ordinance approving the rezoning of property located at 63 75 West 44th Avenue from Commercial One to Mixed Use Neighborhood, case number WZ 1704 Conway. At issue, the applicant is requesting approval of a zoning change for commercial one to mixed use neighborhood for a property located at 6375 West 44th Avenue. The proposed rezoning area includes one parcel, the total size of which is approximately one quarter acre. The purpose of the zone change is to allow the property to be utilized solely as a residential use in the immediate future and have the possibility of being utilized as a live workspace in the future. At this time, the applicant is not proposing any new developments or modifications to the site. If the property is redeveloped in the future under the proposed MUN or mixed use zone uh, zoning, an administrative site plan would be required to confirm that the proposed development meets the standards for the mixed use zone district. Thank you, and I do need an ordinance number on this item. <clears throat> Excuse me, this will be ordinance number 1623. 1623, thank you. 
open the public hearing. Will any will those who will be testifying please stand? That's it. Raise your right hand and if you swear to tell the truth in these matters, if so, answer I do. Thank you. Please have us a report by staff. Records, Zach Wallace Mendez, planner with the Community Development Department. Um, again, I would like to enter into the public record the contents of the case file, the zoning ordinance, the conference of plan, and the digital presentation. Uh, the property is within the city of Wheat Ridge. All appropriate notification and posting requirements have been met, and therefore the city council does have jurisdiction to hear the case. Um, as was previously mentioned, the case is for a request of approval of a zone change from commercial one to mixed use neighborhood on property located at 6375 West 44th Avenue image of the property located along the north side of 44th Avenue adjacent to Hopper Hollow Park. Um, same aerial image with the zoning overlaid on top of it. A um, bit more of that patchwork quilt that is often mentioned. Um, as you can see the property is zoned uh, commercial one. There's other commercial zoning in the area such as the restricted commercial and neighborhood commercial. And then in the periphery away from 44th Avenue is more of the residential R2 and R3 zone districts. Again, a snippet from the comprehensive plan um, shows that this property is located along a neighborhood commercial corridor. Um, that designation envisions a mix of uses um, and is an appropriate transitional district between the commercial corridor and residential zoning um, to the north. Uh, the rezone would allow for residential uses, commercial uses, or a mix of the two. There was a neighborhood meeting held on April 4th. There were four neighbors in attendance. No one has contacted city staff during the public noticing period prior to this hearing. Again, referral utility agencies and other city departments responded with no comments or concerns to the request. Um, if the zone change is approved, the applicant will need to work with the building division in order to receive a residential certificate of occupancy. Right now it has a commercial certificate of occupancy um, and complete any work that would be necessary for the conversion of the, the structure back to a residence. Uh, Planning Commission heard the case during a public hearing on May 18th and recommended approval. Staff does recommend approval of the case. Um, again, there's a more extensive analysis in your staff report, but quickly, um, we find that the proposed and existing zone districts are compatible. The proposed zoning is supported by the comprehensive plan. The proposed zoning is compatible with the surrounding area, excuse me. And the planning commission recommended approval of the zone change. Um, that concludes my quick presentation, and I would be, again, be happy to answer any questions you may have. Council, have any questions? Mr. Matthews. I realize this is just a quarter acre site there, but under the MUN, what type of uses would be potentially applied to this site? Um, so there would be a limited range of commercial uses allowed, more like neighborhood serving commercial uses, less intensive than are currently allowed under the current commercial zoning, in addition to residential uses. What would be the density allowable on that site for a quarter acre? 21 units per acre, so four or five. If it were to redevelop. And mix of commercial, potentially three or four, somehow commercial on the bottom and residential on top, uh, the way they referred to that? That would be allowed, yes, if they were able to meet the setbacks and drive aisle widths that are required by the fire district to gain access to the rear you know, assuming that there would be front and rear kind of units. And they would have to meet all those requirements, but yes, it is possible. Thank you. Other questions? Mm. As far as uh, parking is concerned for this property, um, there isn't much uh, parking in that area to begin with, so there would also have to be, uh, you know, for residential um, parking requirements as well, correct? Yes, if it were to redevelop, yeah, we would make sure to assess the, the, the parking standards that are required. Um, right now, it would be a single-family home, um, which would require two off-street parking spaces, which they do have. Sure, but if it were to be redeveloped, it would, right. um, uh, even if it had the density uh, allowable, the parking requirements would still uh, come into play, which would, would 
which would still limit that as well. Even even if the density was available, the parking would still have some something it would still have some limitations to it as well, correct? Right. Yeah, it would still need to provide the, the number of parking required by the code. Okay. And uh, as it relates to the, um, uh, it's bordered on both sides by city property, correct? Um, so Hopper Hollow is to the east and the north. Um, to the west is private property. Sure. If there's no other questions, um, I don't have anyone signed up to speak publicly from our any citizens, so I'll, I'll move from there. Um, I'm going to close the public hearing, and a motion would be in order, Mr. Urban. Let me go back to the front page. I move to approve Council Bill 11 2017 ordinance approving the rezoning of property located at 6375 West 44th Avenue from Commercial One to Mixed Use Neighborhood on second reading and that it take effect 15 days after final publication for the following reasons. City Council has conducted a proper public hearing that meets all public notice requirements as required by Section 26 109 of the Code of Laws. The requested zone rezoning has been reviewed by the Planning Commission, which forwarded its recommendation for approval. The requested rezoning has been found to comply with the required, with the criteria for review in Section 26-112E of the Code of Laws. Second. Seconded by Councilmember Hoppy. Any further discussion? Please cast your votes. Motion carries five to one with council member Matthews voting no. Thank you. Move on to item number four. Council member Hoppy once again. Please read. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Council Bill number 12-2017, an ordinance reappointing presiding municipal judge Christopher Randall, increasing his hourly compensation and approving a presiding municipal judge services agreement. At issue, the city's home rule charter provides for appointment of the municipal court judge for a term of two years. The current term of presiding judge Christopher Randall expires July 1st, 2017. The judge was reappoint oh sorry, the judge is presently compensated at 96.9 per hour. This rate has been in effect since 2015. The judge requests an in increase to 98.97 per hour. This change is reflected in the attached agreement. Thank you, I need an ordinance number. This will be ordinance number 1624. Thank you, open the public hearing. I don't know if we have a staff report, but I know the judge would like to speak. Quick staff report, uh, uh, Madam Mayor, and yes, the judge is here and would like to okay. address the, the council. The uh, council member Hoppy's description uh, covers uh, really most of the points. The, ordin the charter requires a two year reappointment. The charter also requires that the compensation be set by ordinance. We wouldn't be doing an ordinance, you could just appoint, uh, but because there is a slight compensation change, that triggers the need for an ordinance, and so I just had the ordinance do also the, the reappointment, got it all done uh, at, uh, in, in one place. We also took the opportunity in the presiding municipal judge services agreement to clean it up a little bit. We've been using form we've been using for a long time, and it uh, occurred to me that we needed to make a little more clear that the judge is uh, an employee of the city, not an independent contractor, is a department head. The judge is the department head for the municipal court. Uh, and we m did a little better job of detailing what those the benefits for the judge's position are. They're not changed, it's just we, we felt that, uh, I was able to kind of list them in a way that is a little easier for everyone to keep track of. Uh, I do know the judge uh, would like to take the opportunity to speak with you. You saw him at the study session, but I asked him if he would come to this meeting, and, and he's here, and I know he'd, he'd like to make some comments. But, um, and at some point, the council would like to ask questions of staff, but go ahead, let's have the judge come forward. Whole group. Municipal courts change quite a bit over the last 30 years. I've been a judge 
started part time in Aurora a long time ago. I've been doing this a long time. I think it was pretty sleepy and sleepy and less intense than it is now. Basically, what's happened with the municipal court is we don't like county court. I think the only exception is we don't handle DUIs and driving under revocation. We pretty much do what the county court is doing now. Uh, the other thing that's a little different about Beat Ridge, I'm the presiding judge, the, the boss of the other judges. But also on the department director, so I'm also handling personnel, budget, administration, that kind of thing. There are other judges who do that, but I don't think that's the majority of cities. So my responsibilities are, I would say, divided 50 50, 60 40 between judicial work and administrative work. Certainly requesting uh, another reappointment for two, two more years. Uh, any questions? Questions of the judge at this time? I, I have a question. Uh, your goals for 2017, number nine, is uh, develop strategies, programs, and sentences that mitigate crime, rehabilitate offenders, reduce traffic violations, and influence code issues. My, my question is, do you, and I, I'm not really sure this relates to this particular goal, um, but do we have any, uh, alternative sense sentencing um, programs currently at work? For example, do we send anyone to rehabilitation? Do we have a work program that we allow people to volunteer, or not volunteer, but are assigned to work rather than pay fines and go to jail? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, that's probably been a goal for municipal courts even you know, long before this. Yeah, most people have a sentence that has could have a fine that's suspended or jail that's suspended or both of those things. But it's always on conditions. And it can be anything from treatment, counseling, rehabilitation, classes, uh, getting sober, um, community service as a sentence rather than a fine or jail. So it's really whatever, and I try to individualize it for that particular defendant. It could be something as simple for some defendants as getting your ID. It could be as simple for some defendants as a job. It could be as simple as uh, taking a one-day class. You know, I send a lot of shoplifters to a petty theft class. A lot of people that get into fights and, and disagreements, harassment, disorderly conduct, they typically go to a conflict management class. Those classes are typically one or two days. A lot of people have to get a drug and alcohol evaluation, and I'll take the evaluation, and that'll be part of their sentence or all of it. Possibly. Same thing with psychiatric evaluations, have to deal with a lot of mentally ill people. You get an evaluation, typically your sentence is to, to follow the evaluation, which is usually mental health. <coughs> so I would say not everybody has an alternative sentence, but most people do, especially with crimes, criminal cases. So you say most people do? Yeah, with, right. with adult criminal cases, I would say. So if we find somebody has a, a psychiatric, if you find that somebody has a psychi psychiatric problem, uh, what do you do? What do you assign them? It's typically to an evaluation because I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, <laughs> but we do have the Wheat Ridge Regional Center here. We deal with them almost every week here with their, I think they call them patients there or, or customers or inmates. I already know that they're there, they're debilitated developmentally delayed. They've got issues, I already know. Their sentence is going to be fashioned towards them getting treatment where they are and for bumping up their treatment or their meds or modifying their meds. What, uh, what are we doing to um, handle the situation of the indigent offender who has not paid fines? I know that they're indigent ahead of time, and I know that they're going to remain indigent, or the chances are pretty good that they're not going to have the money to pay that fine. If they can go on a payment plan, I, I almost automatically authorize payment plans for anybody that, that asks for one now. I can no longer issue a warrant for someone's arrest if they simply pay or to pay. They, they don't show up to pay, or they don't pay. It used to be able to do that. It takes the teeth out of collecting fines. It takes the teeth 
uh, paying or getting restitution for victims. Uh, so I think that legislation was pretty short-sighted when it came to victims. That's another reason to have alternative sentencing and try to focus on what's best for that defendant. Like a homeless person, I'm not sure of a fine is of any value for two reasons. Uh, they don't have the money. They're not going to pay it anyway, even if they do come into some money. And an alternative sentence for them might be better. And I typically, with we have a lot of transient homeless people, oftentimes ask them, where are you sleeping tonight? What's your plan for uh, where are you going to stay tonight? And see what they're doing. Most of them go to shelters in Denver. Believe it or not, they come here in the daytime and then go back downtown and try to get a shelter. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Urban. Thank you. And then Mr. Matthews. Um, Judge, as it relates to uh, handling those uh, defendants that are facing a, a drug charge or uh, more specifically those that are uh, dealing with uh, heroin addiction, how are we uh, able to uh, direct those individuals either to specifically rehabilitation for uh, heroin addiction and uh, specifically uh, getting them on that road to recovery and, and is it something that we can consider a, a drug court of some kind or a participation with yeah, Jefferson County? What's happened with municipal court and what's become a trend is we're going to have family courts, drug courts, veterans courts. Municipal court's always been that because we deal with, with uh, crimes that lend themselves more to transients or, or heroin addiction, or any, any drug addiction, sure. homelessness, that type of thing. Uh, with difficulty dealing with uh, serious drug addicts, I, I typically order an evaluation and then most of them can't pay for it or claim that they can't pay for it. We have a fund that the council approves for the last two or three years to pay for evaluation. So I order an evaluation. I would say half of them do it and the other half don't show up in court. And they, they do get a warrant. You can't get a warrant. For them. And I'll deal with it when they get picked up. But at any rate, an evaluation start there. Usually you have to drop clean UAs. Could be AA, NA, group treatment, individual treatment. And I find that a lot of drug addicts typically have emotional issues as well, or psychiatric issues, so they're dual diagnosis. And then sometimes I'll address that. So if they participate in those uh, programs, then they'll, that, that, that'll keep them out of the courtroom, correct? Yeah, it'll keep them out of jail. Sure. Out of the so we have a probation department. That's <coughs> quite unique. I think there's, there are a fair number of the municipal courts that have probation departments, but it's the bigger cities, uh, the larger the metro area cities, City. So, probation officer supervises I guess just going back to the study session uh, discussion relative to the heavy docket that we have and, and knowing that uh, the, uh, the the opioid ad, uh, addiction uh, epidemic is just so overwhelming that we have to do something to sort of uh, clear the docket as best we can and knowing that that, that is probably a, a large uh, or an increasingly large percentage of that uh, docket that we, we have to do whatever we can to try to remove those elements from that docket so we can focus on maybe the more egregious crimes that uh, uh, present, you know, you know, th those defendants that are, you know, presenting violence or other real safety issues to the community and try to get those individuals who are, you know, ne needing rehabilitation to the services they need versus putting them in jail or otherwise, you know, putting them down a, a path of, um, not getting the recovery they need. So that's my ask to you is just to try to continue to work on reducing that docket as best we can, or working with the police to try to figure out how we can reduce that docket. I don't know what, what the silver bullet is to that, but when you said that you know we as a city have a heavier docket than most, that, that is somewhat concerning to me. And uh, given we do live in sort of that first ring suburb position, and I understand that puts us at a disadvantage and we're next to the highway and whatnot, but nevertheless, uh, we shouldn't be uh, so offensive as a populace that we continue to overload your docket. So uh, that, that needs to kind of be looked at as to how can we uh, lessen the burden on that docket, uh, both by working with the police and making sure that they're not asking you to unduly sort of settle it out in court uh, as well. So we need to find that, that fine balance, I think, and making sure that we have a, a good uh, balance between uh, the justice that you provide and the law and order that the police provide on the ground and finding that good balance. But do you see that that's a good working relationship between you and the police? Oh, sure. Yes. Okay. 
Thank you. Mr. Matthews. Do, do we have, and I'm going to ask you just one or two quick questions, and I had a gazillion for you, but unfortunately I could not be here for the study session, and I don't want to take a lot of time tonight, but do we have any metrics at all that we use to try and keep track of how effective uh, we think our municipal court system is being as far as reducing crime or stopping repeat offenders or something of that nature? The way it works is, uh, I, A, I recognize repeat offenders. Uh, two, whenever somebody comes into municipal court, if they have another municipal court case, and I have that file, most of the time I'll look at that old file first to see when they were here, why they were here, what their sentence was, if the sentence worked, you know, did, if they were on probation, did that work, did they end up failing and going to jail, were they successful, that type of thing. So I think that the, and I'll tell you, some of the, Hardcore drug, drug addicts are typical or uh, difficult to deal with, difficult to reach, difficult to cure or rehabilitate. I would say a fair number don't make it. Um, and, and the way it works, you start with treatment, and then, then the, if that fails, and it's their fault, sometimes it's not their fault, but if it's their fault, they're willingly refused to comply with the sentence, and there's always some amount of detention in the county facility. But I think the metric, there's no scientific study or no, um, I don't know that we, a probation keeps track of failures and successes, but as far as everybody else, it's probably me just having the files in front of me from the old case to know how we did. And I would say most people do okay or succeed or improve. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, once again, I don't have any public testimony signed up. I'm going to close the public meeting and I'm going to ask for a motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move to approve Council Bill Number 12-2017, an ordinance reappointing presiding municipal judge Christopher Randall, increasing his hourly compensation and approving a presiding municipal judge services agreement. On second reading, order it published and take effect upon adoption. Second. Seconded by Ms. Duran. Any discussion? Mr. Fitzgerald. Judge Randall is, is asking for an increase from $96 an hour to $99 an hour. For comparison, the governor of the state of Colorado earns $55.80 an hour. The chief Justice of the Colorado Supreme Court earns $92 an hour. Uh, the city that is most comparable to us in size is Englewood. They pay their judge $66.48 an hour. Uh, Lakewood is $64, Arvada is $71. Um, judge Randall is currently the highest paid, uh, paid judge on the front range, including uh, state judges and the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Um, he currently, without a raise, uh, earns more than the city manager, more than every department head in the city, um, including the police chief. Um, and he's asking for a raise at a time when the city is undergoing a severe financial stress. We're uh, bouncing up and down around our, uh, our limit, our 17% our, our reserve. Um, we've asked every department in the city to um, save money. And for those of you who may be watching, of course, one of the factors is uh, We've lost tax income from our Walmart, which was a significant contributor to the city. Uh, I, I just don't think that it is reasonable, uh, and I'm not making a, a statement about the quality of judgeship here. I'm making a statement about the fact that he already is very well paid, better than anyone else. Um, and 
uh, we're asking the rest of the city to tighten their belts. It just doesn't seem right to give him a raise at a time everybody else has to tighten their belt. Just uh, for information, he currently earns about $188,000 a year, and he has about $23,000 in benefits. So um, he's, he's part-time, only works three days. So that's, that's pretty good income for, for a three-day work week. So I would be against um, this contract. I have a proposal, a, a, a modified uh, motion when we get to that point um, that would reflect uh, renewing the contract at his current rate. Okay. Ms. Hoppy. While the um, data that we were given to compare what other judges and other uh, communities get paid, was different because not everybody pays the same. Um, some things that I would like to point out is that while our judge only gets 160 leave hours, if you look at Thornton, they get 414. And if you look at Arvada, they get 216. And um, just, just looking at just Arvada and Thornton, Arvada has um, a better retirement plan for their judge. Thornton has a better retirement plan for their judge. They also have a, a, a bonus plan. So it's not apples to apples, but if you do some of the work and, and kind of extrapolate it, they're all about the working around the same. I feel like what we do mostly is that we have more of a higher base rate, but then our benefits are um, skinnier than the other m municipalities. And also, most of these places don't also have their judge be the department head on top of um, their work. So I would just like to uh, enter that for consideration. Mr. Um, as uh, Councilmember Fitzgerald indicated that the uh, presiding judge would only be working three days a week, the contract as I read it indicates that there would be at least 32 hours uh, per week that the judge would be working, so that would be at least 10 hours per day that the judge would be here. So I'm not certain why we're throwing around these numbers. And is, is, is it, uh, at, at, from what I hear and from what I've seen, is that the judge is here more than uh, three days per week. Um, and at the same time, uh, we might pay him uh, more than other judges, but uh, if we have both him and a department head uh, working side by side, we'd be paying that uh, department head just as much or a little bit less, and that would be even more than what other cities are paying because we're not taking into consideration what other cities are paying that other person to do that job as well. So we have to take into consideration how we're comparing these uh, different uh, systems to each other, and that uh, in Wheat Ridge we are somewhat uh, streamlined and uh, very much a uh, sort of a one-man show here so uh, we do uh, we don't say how many days but we do say how many hours we're looking for um, but uh, I think that it's important to kind of point out um, the fact that uh, he's not just showing up uh, three days per se it's the number of hours that we're looking for so um, and the fact that uh, if we don't uh, go for this then we might be looking at having to hire another individual in addition to a judge which may end up costing us even more money if we are concerned about the expenses that we're uh, putting into this. So that's something to consider. Mr. Matthews. Well, I um, believe Mr. Dahl would be the supervisor for, the, for our judge. Uh, or, or is he working directly for us, or do you, are you an intermediate intermediary there? I'm not. I, I, um do some facilitation. I facilitate the contract uh, to the extent the council has, you know, wants to adopt ordinances or revise them that, that would get enforced. Then I'm the right person to communicate that to the judge, and I do things like that. I work with the prosecutor, uh, but um, because the judge is the department head, department heads in Wheat Ridge are supervised by the city manager. All right. All right. Well, department heads are yeah. supervised by the city manager, but the city council points and supervises yeah. the judge. I do, I do not supervise the, the 
presiding judge. That, that this, there's, a, there's a very a hybrid kind of situation here um, where this has evolved, I think, over time with the judge's contract that he has taken on more department head-like duties, but I do not supervise the judge as, as city manager, as I do the other department directors. Mr. Fitzgerald. Uh, speaking to Mr. Urban, um, in the judge's letter, um, himself he says he works uh, two extra hours on the two days that um, he holds court and the third day is is a day for his supervision and uh, his supervision of his department so that's what he's he himself says in his letter and I, I might also point out he has far fewer people to supervise than, than other department heads in the city who earn somewhere in the neighborhood of 30% less than he, he's asking for. Mr. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the conversation. Thank you to the judge for your service. Um, I've, and I'm gonna restate some of the things that I stated in the study session, uh, study session previously. Um, I um, do believe um, that uh, the judge should be reappointed. I'm less convinced about the increases in hourly compensation. However, I don't. I, I see it. I see everyone's point that's previously spoken on the on the issue, which is to say that it's our responsibility per the per the agreement, uh, the services agreement previously, I believe, and certainly the one that's drafted in 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 this uh, um, packet. We're the, we're the ones who were um, dealing with performance and compensation. And, and, and frankly, I, feel, you know, I think that that means we have to be probably a little bit more involved in it um, other than just coming up and having a reappointment. And I know we are. We, I think once, once a year or so we have a little bit of face time. But that's, perhaps I'm still not convinced one way or the other. I, I look at it right now, and and from what we have in the report and what we've seen over the study session and the, the last year or so of of um, having um, reports come to us, is that the judge is currently being fairly compensated, not too much, not too little, and so you know I'm not um, I, I'm very um, keen on us actually reappointing a judge and moving forward. So I hope we can, however the business um, concludes tonight, we get to that point. Um, and um, again, I'm less, I'm less um, kind of convinced on the extreme side of things. I, I do believe that the compensation is fair right now. Anyone else? Madam Mayor, one, one point. Um, this is an ordinance. Uh, there's six of you here uh, by charter. It takes five votes to pass an ordinance. So I, it's my job to kind of remind you of that. Um, I appreciate uh, Patrick's point about supervision. I went back to the charter, and, and he's right. The charter for the, the manager has the department heads being subject to appointment and dismissal by, by the manager. Obviously, the overriding charter provision is the municipal judge who's appointed and dismissed uh, by you. By charter, you can't dismiss the judge during the two-year term except for a very narrow list of sort of felonious behavior not uh, and and that makes sense because you don't the the judge needs to be generally free to do his job and, and judge cases without fear of being dismissed because he's ruling the wrong way kind of thing and that's a very typical pattern around the state those are the only two things i wanted to mention thank you mm -hmm. mr pond would like to just make a point. just a point for clarification if in fact there was an amendment to this motion if that's the way that it, it went that mo that amendment doesn't necessarily need five it's the final it's that, the final motion for ordinance that does that's correct okay. good point all right mm -hmm. Mr. thank you madam mayor um, as it relates to the contract you indicated some changes that were made um, the <coughs> The number of hours that were proposed previously were 32, and now it's 30. I understand that. Y yes, that's that's right. We went back and forth a little bit on how to articulate that, and ended up with 
the judge has indicated, and you certainly can reopen the hearing and ask him as well, and should if this is a continuing question. But we ended up with a minimum of 30. The judge was saying, look, there are weeks I do much more than that. The judge was concerned about writing a minimum of 32 because it varies, but he was comfortable with saying, look, there's 30. That's also kind of a level in the personnel system within our system. So it was not an indication of working less, but rather just as things vary from week to week, he was more comfortable with 30, understanding he spends more time than that. And the increase is to 98.97 per hour, correct? Yes, that's right. The other changes were primarily under the Article V, Demnification Insurance and Benefits. There was a reference to the judge being an independent contractor that had kind of left kind of some orphan statement in the contract for a number of years that I failed to catch, and he's an employee. He's a W-2 employee at the city, and so you can't be both. You can't be a 1099 and a W-2, so we took that out. The benefits were kind of all squeezed together in a paragraph. It was hard really to track, and so we put those in bullet points. I think I emphasized that he is, in fact, the department head. He had been functioning that way, but I wanted to make sure, frankly, that the duties included that. So those were, as I recall, the primary changes that we made were around the Employment Relationship Insurance Benefits provision. Mr. Matthews. Since we've kind of got on this topic, one quick question. Do we pay the judge overtime over 30 or 32 hours a week at time and a half? How has this worked out? Is he exempt? Exempt employee. So the answer would be no. Is that right? Yeah. So the point I'm making is he's basically on salary and not if he comes in on Saturday, that's on his nickel, not ours, so to speak. All right. We have a motion and a second on the floor, and I've heard hint of an amendment. If you're going to do that, go ahead. Okay. I consider this a friendly amendment because I wish to retain the judge. It's just I would rather not increase his salary at this present time. So I move that the motion be amended to take out the line, increasing his hourly compensation and improving presiding missile. Just excuse me, increasing his hourly compensation. Take that out and substitute retaining his present compensation. And do we then, Mr. Dahl, have to change the other legal document in here, the contract itself? Yeah. No. What I would, if that motion, if that amendment passes and the motion passes with that amendment, then you will have directed that that's the contract amount now is less. Certainly takes two parties to sign a contract, and that sort of creates now an offer from the judge at the present rate. The judge can sign that contract or not. Okay. So my friendly amendment is to take out increasing his hourly compensation and substituting retaining his present compensation. Second. The amendment has been seconded. We now have a vote on the amendment. Oh, discussion. Sorry. Thank you very much. I'll be voting no on this because I think that we need to at least look at some sort of percent of increase. The proposed is a 3% increase. A 2% increase would be $98.01 per hour, and a 1.5% increase, which would be the lowest that I would go, would be $97.53 an hour. So I'll be voting no for this for now. Anyone else want to make a comment? All right. Then I need a vote on the amendment, which is to remove increasing his hourly compensation, retaining his present compensation. But retain, but go ahead and fulfilling, reappointing. Thank you. Thank you. 
Motion fails two to four with council members Matthews, Urban, Hoppy, and Duran voting no. Hey, can we go back then to the main motion? Just a minute, please. The main motion is as it was stated in our in our uh, notebooks here, or as as presented to us, and uh, I don't. Unless there's more discussion, I don't think we need any. Please go ahead and vote on that main motion. Motion carries five to one with council member Pond voting no. Okay. I think we need to say congratulations to the judge. Congratulations to the judge. I have just one question for the judge. As, as you're taking a look at these people that come before you, um, would you consider running for city council as a psychiatric aberration? <laughs> <laughs> Should we all be insulted about that? Okay, let's move on to item number five, Mr. Urban. Council Bill 13-2017, an ordinance approving a lease with Verizon Wireless for placement of cellular antenna facility on the Wheat Ridge Recreation Center. At issue, Council is asked to approve a lease with Verizon Wireless for placement of a cellular antenna facility on the Wheat Ridge Recreation Center. The, park the Parks and Recreation Department has been negotiating with Verizon for several months. The term is five years with three options to extend for five years each. The annual rental payment is $25,000 for the first year increasing 2% for each following year. The antenna facility will be fully contained on the roof of the building as shown in the attached photo simulations. There will be an accessory concrete uh, pad 10 by 10 at the rear west side of the building. Location diagram and photo simulation are attached. Thank you. I need an ordinance number on this. This will be ordinance number 1625. Thank you. I'm an open public meeting is opened. Do we have a staff presentation? Uh, very briefly, we have worked uh, long and hard with Verizon on uh, this and gone back and forth on uh, quite a few drafts, and uh, the staff's recommending approval of this, of this uh, lease. Uh, at the, the lease rate represents uh, a, a good rate in the market now. Uh, you always want to make sure you check, and we network that quite a bit around the state. Um, you'll notice that the uh, council action form mentions that the rec center was built with, uh, in part, open space funds. And open space, when you use their funds, uh, has a reverter clause. Speaking of reverters, and we've seen those before, they have one on the property uh, because you've got to use it for recreation purposes. If you dispose of it for some other purpose, the reverter kicks in. This is one of those other purposes. It's different than parks and open space. Uh, the, the open space is fairly, uh, I won't say generous, but they're fairly uh, uh, comfortable with requests to say, look, we're going to make this other minor use. It doesn't detract from the parks and open space use. It, it's not going to be visible. The, the, the primary and, and overwhelming use of the property remains open space. That's consistent with the use of open space funds. But you have to make that case to them. And uh, Joyce did so, going to the to, to the OSAC committee. They make a recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners, who ultimately approves an exception or a subordination to their reverter, subordinating to the to the lease, and and that's that's important. And we have obtained that. The council action form says they were to act in the near future. That was written after the OSAC meeting, but before Board of County Commissioners. They've since met recently and approved it. So we've checked the box at the county, but I wanted to, to let you know that that was an important part of the, it seems minor. You would think, well, the antenna on the top of the roof, what's the problem with that? But they take it rather seriously at the county, and, and I kind of honor that, that, that you don't want the open space purpose over time to leak away. 
and they're really pretty vigilant. I'm reporting to you that they really are. Uh, but, but in the end, I think we ended up with not only a good lease, but uh, a good design. Uh, if you have questions about that, Joyce can probably answer them better than I can, but there is uh, both uh, a facility on the roof, which is kind of in a little box, as you see in the photo simulations, and then they need a pad, I think it's 10 by 10 concrete pad in the back. There'll be conduit running down the side of the uh, building. We've worked carefully with them on the colors, the texture, and the materials for, for everything. And if you have questions specifically on those, I think Joyce could probably answer them. Uh, but uh, that's kind of the structure of the, of the lease and, and why uh, it took us really as long as it did to get it in place. Thank you. Um, it, yeah, Mr. Urban. Thank you. Um, so we're getting a good rate as far as our lease is concerned, you yep. said? Yeah, yeah, we are. Uh, I put this up to the attorney's listserv, uh, which is a municipal attorney's listserv. The other people like me, they're negotiating leases on rec centers and city halls around the state, and uh, this is this is a, a good solid, a good solid rate for this kind of uh, facility. And so, there's other uh, public facilities that are being used by yep. uh, entities such as Verizon for these type of cellular towers. Yep. And absolutely, yeah. They, it, it's, it's in a sense, it's one of their kind of favorite places to go because it's a landlord that, that, that they know they can work with, that will be there for a long time. Uh, you know, we have similar leases on the big tower here uh, behind this building, sure. uh, which is not the stealth kind of tower at all that will be on the rec center and should be on the rec center. So yeah, it's, um, uh, I think they're a good partner to work with. And as far as the, the aesthetics of this uh, particular design, it, it falls within line of our uh, our code and, and as far as if this were any other building, this would still be kosher, so to speak? It does. It, it um, uh, Building Community Development Department staff reviewed this and um, um, actually made Verizon Wireless, made some changes to meet our code. Okay. That's, that's what I just that's want to make sure that. No, I don't have anything to add with, to them, but yes, it meets all code. And these are antenna. They're not like a the tower that we have back here and they're screened and we did also consult with um, the original architect for the building and they gave us some good input as okay. well as the design so I think they'll be they'll be as, as aesthetic as they can be and it doesn't add any additional load to the roof or any other kind of problems relative uh, our building department has uh, taken that into account reviewed the plans and approved them and told them how they had to be installed to mitigate that load Any other questions? Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I can close the public meeting. And I need a motion. Um, just one minute. All right. I move to approve Council Bill 13 2017 on ordinance approving a lease with Verizon Wireless for placement of a cellular antenna facility on the Wheat Ridge Recreation Center on second reading that it take effect upon adoption. Second, please. Second. Second. Who's that going to be? Mr. Matthews and Ms. Duran uh, had a race for, to the end. Pick one. It was Duran first. Duran. I believe Ms. Duran got, uh, got it out first. Okay. Any further discussion? If none, please cast your vote. Motion carries six to zero. Uh, Mr. Matthews, if you introduce item number six. Item number six is Council Bill number 14-2017, an ordinance amending sections 16-81 and 1684 of the Wheat Ridge Code of Laws to legalize gravity knives and switchblades consistent with state law. At issue is uh, the following. Through the adoption of Senate Bill 17-008 during the last legislative session, the Colorado Legislature amended state statutes to remove gravity knives and switchblades from the list of weapons that it is unlawful to possess under state law. This amendment goes into effect on August 9th of 2017. The Wheat Ridge Police Department recommends amending sections 16-81 and 16-84 of the Wheat Ridge Code of Laws to legalize gravity knives and switchblades to be consistent with state law. I need an ordinance number. 
This will be or this will be ordinance number sixteen twenty six. Twenty six. Once again, open a public hearing. Do I have a staff report? I see we have the police chief here. Uh, just uh, briefly, I think Division Chief Lorenz had provided council with an update at the study session on uh, or a study session on this. Where we we're talking about it. This is a uh, uh, general assembly change. State legislature look at, looked at this during the last session and made a decision to uh, make these changes, uh, primarily because uh, the world of knives has changed quite a bit. Uh, the knives that are produced today are, are, are just as easy to, uh, uh, to open, uh, just as quick uh, as a switchblade or a gravity knife. So what you have before you today is, is really a change to 1681 of our uh, code of laws, which is the definition. It just removes the definition for uh, those two knives, takes those out, and then section 1684 uh, takes out the term switchblade knife and gravity knife as being an illegal weapon in the city, and it puts us in alignment with the state statute, which makes the job of my officers a lot easier because there's no conflict there in regards to uh, uh, how we pursue the law. Thank you. We don't really have much choice, do we? Uh, not too much, but uh, you know, it's just one of those things where you know you, we want our criminal code to uh, to mirror the state criminal code. It just makes our job a lot easier. Council, have any questions of, mm -hmm. of the chief, Mr. Urban? In, in what regard does this uh, make it easier for us? Does it make it easier in the sense that the uh, officers don't aren't necessarily having to charge individuals who are carrying these knives or? What is it that I don't know that it, it, you know if you interpreted what I said as easier, it doesn't make our job any easier. It just makes it uh, puts it in alignment, so we don't have to remember that our code is different than state law. Oh sure. So it, it comports to that. So uh, uh, we don't have a lot of these violations uh, anyway. Uh, I don't think they do statewide as as well. Uh, so we want to make sure that that our criminal code mirrors the state code as as much as we can. So that's what this does. I don't have any indication. Did, Mr. Matthews, did you want to ask something? I think it bears mentioning just the two definitions of the two items so people know what we're talking about, if I can read those. Uh, gravity knife means any knife, uh, the blade of which is released from the handle or sheath there by force or gravity of the application of centrifugal force uh, and which the blade upon release becomes locked in place by means of a button, spring, plate, level, or other device. A switch knife means a knife, the blade of which opens automatically by manual pressure applied to the button, spring, or other device in its handle. Uh, and the, uh, the length of those knives, uh, this is a question for the chief, the, the length of those knives is still a matter of uh, concern, correct? Right. Uh, state law limits the uh, length of a knife to, I think it's three and a half inches, unless it's uh, a knife that's used for hunting uh, purposes. Thank you outdoor activity purposes, those kinds of things. So again, it's, it keeps us in alignment with the state statute. Okay, I'm going to close this hearing. I'd like a motion and then a second. I move to approve Council Bill 14-2017, an ordinance to amend section 16-81 and 16-84 of the Wheat Ridge Code of Laws to legalize gravity knives and switchblades consistent with state law on second reading and that it take effect 15 days after final publication. Second on that, please. Mr. Ann, come on. Second. <laughs> Somebody else second? Yeah, Ms. Hop Hoppy, I believe, got in there oh. this time. Okay. I'm going to, some of you hadn't voted. I'm going to clear it again. Okay, now you can vote. Go ahead and vote, yeah. Motion carries six to zero. Okay, our last item is number seven. And Mr. Pond is going to read that for us. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm happy to introduce resolution number 25-2017, a resolution adopting the City of Wheat Ridge Bicycle and Pedestrian Master Plan. At issue, the City's Bicycle Pedestrian Master Plan serves as a guide to plan, construct, enhance, and improve bicycle and pedestrian mobility throughout the city. The plan also guides and works in conjunction with the Capital Improvement Plan to identify opportunities for improvements. 
In late 2015, it was felt by staff, council, and the community that the plan needed to be updated as a result of changing travel modes, community needs, and priorities, and to also incorporate latest industry practices. I see we're ready for a staff report. I don't have to open a meeting this time. Okay, Go thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Jane, members of the council. Uh, I just have a brief presentation here that I'll PowerPoint. Here. Also, want to uh, recognize uh, Joe Fish in the audience, who's from the Tool uh, Design Consulting Group. Uh, uh, Joe's uh, team and uh, company there shepherded us and helped drive a lot of the effort through this process. Thank you for the we have they did. So, I'll just give this brief presentation and then when I'm done, if there's any questions the council has, uh, I will or Joe will try to answer those questions. Uh, but as you you may recall we uh, brought the master plan, the draft final plan to City Council back on uh, May 9th, I believe it was. Uh, went over a, a similar presentation here uh, on the plan. Uh, we did get a few comments that we uh, incorporated into the plan and also in the last couple of months did just get a, get a couple little more extra input and uh, comments from the public too, which we considered. Uh, we started this process about a year ago now, and uh, uh, this slide here kind of just uh, gives an overview of the steps we went through to get to where we are now. Uh, started just with a lot of data gathering and mapping, getting all the information we have together. Uh, public process was a big part of this, and the next step. Uh, we did that in a variety of ways, which I will get into in a minute. Uh, then out of that came some initial recommendations. Uh, we then started putting the plan itself together kicked out about uh, March or April after we got a lot of more public comment after we put out the uh, plan. Uh, as part of the public engagement process, we did this a variety of ways. Uh, we tried to reach out to the public the best we could to get as much input. We did that in a variety of ways. Um, vision and goals workshop, the photo there you see, we invited uh, various stakeholders in the community and also from our neighbors of uh, Arvada. Denver Lakewood because uh, inter-community connectivity was, was a big uh, factor and a level of support with this too. Uh, we got out to community events as much as we could, like Ridge Fest, uh, our nation festival, we tried to get out to the public. Uh, in this uh, technical advisory committee, uh, in addition to our neighboring communities, we had members of uh, the ADAT, AD the uh, uh, Active Transportation Advisory Team, Mike Jeffco, Senior communities come in and, and participate from the school district, uh, RTD, CDOT, and so forth. So we tried to bring in as many people as we could. Uh, one of the uh, features on this, which was really helpful, was an on, online map based survey, which was a, uh, uh, another word for that was called a wiki map, where people can log in and it pulls up a map of the city. And they can just go and click on the, on the uh, map anywhere they want. Uh, this is an example of that. Um, and they can click on a street, like say, So we, we got a lot of feedback that way too. Really helpful. Uh, again, the, the vision, this is really what we were looking to, uh, to accomplish here from the beginning. Where the vision we kept in the back of our mind is because we got through this process and I started plowing through all the details. Uh, I just want to throw, show, throw out a couple of graphs here. These were also presented at the uh, study session. Um, but I, I think the main takeaway from this is shows from, you know, from 2000 to 2015, uh, walking commute rates are, are increasing significantly, not just in Weaver here, but also in the Denver area. Uh, this is from census data, uh, it, it really just reflects the commuting, so it really doesn't give you a whole picture as far as how uh, walking and alternative transportation is on the rise. Uh, same with the bicycle uh, commute rates uh, in Weaver here. So we see a significant Things into account why uh, you know, why we can improve uh, our infrastructure here for uh, bicycle and pets. Uh, the biggest uh, one of the biggest complaints we heard was places there just isn't any sidewalk. It's just uh, by a busy street, there's no sidewalk. Uh, gaps in the sidewalk is they may have a sidewalk, and it's all of a sudden you have a spot where there's no sidewalk. What do I do now with the street? Uh, uh, and then the typical concerns we get about traffic. 
kind of some similar com uh, comments with biking. Uh, a lot of it is about traffic. Uh, I think with the, with the biking, some cyclists are comfortable riding in traffic, but uh, uh, many aren't. And we're trying to increase ridership, especially <coughs> uh, families and people that maybe want to go out and, and bike, but they're, they're tentative to do so because they don't feel safe. So uh, when we see these things like uh, bike, <coughs> no existing trails, those are major factors. Uh, some key uh, themes, recommendations that came out of this were uh, uh, access to the Gold Line Station, uh, connectivity with some of our neighbors up there. There's a lot going up there along the G Line that came up quite a bit. Uh, access to Clear Creek Trail is a big one. It's, uh, uh, that's, that's kind of our crown jewel in the city as far as uh, uh, a nice uh, recreational bicycle path, even commuting and walking through the city. And it's really hard to get to it. South side, uh, uh, getting to the creek and up to the trail can be pretty tough. And uh, from the north, too, getting across I 70 and, and some of those busier streets. Uh, we talked a lot about connectivity with our neighbors, also. Uh, so we can see uh, Crown Hill, uh, Denver, Nevada, and so forth. Uh, access to transit is, 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 getting, is getting bigger. Uh, and focusing on the key destinations, such as the schools, the parks, and so forth. Um, Integration with our ADA transition plan. That'll be uh, coming back to you probably in a couple months to uh, talk more about that as we get that wrapped up. Um, and serving needs of aging population and younger families. So this plan is really all encompassing as far as the demographics of the city goes. Everybody um, seems to want to, you know, whether it's get access to transit or find it easier to walk or to bike to get to destinations. Uh, part of what came out of the plan, I just pulled a couple of maps out of it. Uh, which shows our pedestrian network. This is just a, a general overview of the main corridors of busier streets, showing uh, you know, where we have sidewalks, where we don't, where some of the needs are. Uh, the plan itself has more details for uh, more of our local streets. Uh, bicycle, the same thing, uh, just a general overview there of uh, what we have and where we have needs. Uh, this is just a big list of some of the higher priority projects that came out of the uh, out of the study and out of the public input. Uh, you kind of see the dollar signs over there that uh, gives you an idea what some of these uh, improvements cost. Sidewalks in general would cost more, uh, you know, building uh, the back behind the road. Uh, a lot of times it may involve easements or moving trees, retaining walls that drives up the cost. Uh, bike lanes are pretty cheap. You can see the single dollar signs there. A lot of times that's just paint on the pavement. So. Uh, there's a range of uh, improvements and uh, costs here, but uh, the thing we like to really use this list for is more for a, a, a blueprint for leveraging purposes because we know a lot of these projects we can't uh, really do on their own. We have uh, some streets that need to be rebuilt, we have drainage problems, and uh, there's opportunities with these too. Uh, say a paving project, that's a good time to do bike lanes, or a redevelopment project, that's a good time to do sidewalks. So with this list, and a lot of the other things we have going on at the city allows us to really uh, identify how things come together and uh, you know, how we can leverage things. Um, you know, that's that's pretty much it. I'll open up for questions, but one last thing I want to add is I, I kind of went over projects here and infrastructure, but uh, there's really a lot more to the plan than just that that's in it. There's a lot about programming and education and uh, funding and grants and how we can best go, for those, go, up, go pursue those. Uh, enforcement, uh, you know, increasing our online presence, getting the word out, and so forth. Uh, a lot of other things we can do too to improve uh, biking and walking aside from just uh, building things. So, uh, with that, I'll open up to any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you for the report. I'm going to start with Mr. M. Thank you. I didn't see anything in there regarding 29th Avenue, so I was a little disappointed. Did that not come up at all in the survey that was done because I've been asked about that quite often because there's a whole section without sidewalks. Yeah, the sidewalk on 29th. Mm -hmm. yeah this, this map here just is, is well, it says high priority projects and there are other project lists in the plan that, that are more comprehensive that show more sidewalks, more bike improvements and so that's what 29th is the yeah. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hoppy. 
thanks for your presentation. As it relates to the ADA transition plan, I'm sure that a lot of that is um, kind of crossover. And so if it's already addressed in the ADA, well, how, how, how do you look at that if it crossover, if it crosses over? Can you tell us? Yeah, uh, one of the things we're going to be doing uh, when the ADA transition plan comes back to you, and, um, and we talk about that more particularly when we go through the budget process, um, the ADA transition plan is going to have a capital piece to it uh, where it identifies needs and priorities and, and the different scenarios with that, like if you spend this much, you get this much, do this much, and we, we try and accomplish it over five years, 10 years, 20 years, so forth. And that really relates to uh, the biking and the walking, the sidewalks and trails, too, because where we do have these needs where there are gaps, um, more than likely there, there's, there's some ADA related. And also, too, where we do have facilities right now, uh, sidewalks, we have ramps that are substandard that don't meet uh, our ADA requirements, so we want to make sure we get those, too. Uh, kind of first, from a safety standpoint, more than anything, we really identify the places where the higher needs are, the highest traffic, and where the biggest exposure and liability might be as well. So if it's already, if it's on in the ADA transition plan and it's listed as a priority, then um, does it get also listed as a priority in this plan, or does it get listed as a sub-priority because it's already addressed in a different plan? Yeah, it, it can be a priority with this plan. Um, like I said, this interrelates with a lot of the other things we have going on, like redevelopment and street improvements, and the ADA needs these things all kind of flow together. Uh, depending on timing, you know, when we get funding, you know, when things can happen, uh, and these all, these all kick in. But uh, we do prioritize them together as much as we can, but never get dollars. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Matthews. Yeah, I'm looking at your graphs here. It's chapter two, walking and biking in Wheat Ridge today. Uh, what is the, the basis for the, the numbers here? I mean, um, working, uh, people who bike to work increased from 40 in 2000 to 200 by 2015. Where's that data come from? Uh, that would be it. It's a little different. Uh -huh. I mean, it's page 10, but it's just bicycling commute rates in 2000 and 215 for, for neighboring cities. Where does that data come from? Yeah, this, well, on, the, on the graphs here, this comes from U.S. Census data. And, you know, I don't know if there are any other sources that we pull this from. Yeah, it's all from the U.S. Census. How are those questions stated? Is it, do they work, ride to, to work once a week, once a day, once a year? Summers only. And it applies also to walking and other commuting methods, but. What was the most common way that you got to work last week? So if you took that. In the summer, you might have 100 respondents, and if you did it in the dead of winter, you might have zero. Yeah, they do the survey year-round, is my understanding. Who? Okay. Who, who did it? The U.S. Census. And whom did they survey? Uh, it's a sample of the population that gets the survey. Who sampled Wheat Ridge? The census? Thank How about you. the American Community Survey? You want to find out more just Let me add, this is Joel Fish. Uh, Joel, you're the, uh, the design group, tool design that we hired. I, I just thought you should be, you know, who, you, who we were speaking to. So, Any so other how questions many times while we a, have him? a year does that survey come out? Um, it's, my understanding is that it's, it's issued on a continuing basis throughout the year in order to get a representative. Okay, I'm still trying to tie down here. Household A gets that in the middle of the summer, and, and, or it comes out today when it's 80 degrees out and everyone's out recreating and yeah. riding their bike. Does the same household get it again in the middle of winter, or does it? I mean, yeah, it would be another household that would get it in the winter. And it's, uh, I mean, it's probably around 1,000 people or more that get it every year. Okay. 
Okay, I just, it's their methodology. I'm trying to get tied around as far as getting realistic average numbers and not just a, 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 a quick spot look in time. Oh yeah, last week, 100 people said so. Thank you. Other questions or comments? In, in there. Mr. Arben. Thank you. Um, this is for uh, Scott Brink. As it relates to the uh, um, sort of the practical implement implementation of this uh, plan, um, talking about funding, is there any uh, data that would show the uh, the level of funding the city of Wheat Ridge has provided to these facilities compared to other municipalities and how we've uh, fared as far as um, implementing these plans compared to other municipalities and as far as what kind of progress we're making because when I look at this plan it seems like we've got a long longer list of facilities yet to be completed but uh, when I look at the accomplishments it seems like we've done quite a bit of work uh, already so uh, to me it I'm trying to find some other metric to say that uh, you know it seems like Wheat Ridge has been throwing a, a significant amount of money at bicycle and pedestrian amenities um, in the near term. So uh, to me, I'd, I'd like to at least understand um, in comparing other municipalities to Wheat Ridge, uh, not just uh, as we've done in the report so far, but as it relates to dollar-wise and investment-wise, how do we compare with other uh, surrounding municipalities? Yeah, I, I don't have specific data on that presently, but uh, I think when we go through the uh, CIP process coming up in the budget process and we start uh, looking at uh, kicking in some money for, for projects, you know, you know we, can, we can quantify that and see how we compare to other cities uh, with what we're spending. It, uh, you know, it, it can vary. It, uh, you know, for example, the, the bike lanes you know, are fairly inexpensive and we just combine those with the, the paving projects as opposed to, say, a major sidewalk project, maybe where you spend a ton of money and uh, you're getting a much shorter distance. So, you know, how we quantify that, whether it's, you know, the miles of infrastructure that we've completed or is it the dollars we've spent, I mean, we, we can certainly take a look at that and see how it compares. And uh, what was the process for Appendix uh, C to be included into the plan? You might describe Appendix C. I'm sure they know what it is. Well, I'm thinking about citizens. Right. Better remember what Appendix C is. D was funding sources. Let's see what C is. It's listed as a uh, Wheat Ridge uh, Rec High Pedestrian uh, Corridors. Pedestrian priority routes. So what, I'm just curious as to what, uh, what benefit does that add to the plan then to have this in there if, if you've already sort of synthesized it into the plan? Uh, I think it's more just for documentation of the process that, that this was a, a part of what we looked at um, because the ADAT really knows the community very well um, and, and, and lives in these neighborhoods. And, um, so we wanted to be sure to reflect that but Okay. Um, and just uh, really quickly, as it relates to some of the funding mechanisms that were referenced, 
One of them is the Walmart Foundation. Um, so, you know, I find that somewhat ironic in that we're recommending that uh, we go to the Walmart Foundation for funding. Uh, at the same time, other individuals are boasting about the fact that we don't have a Walmart in Wheat Ridge. So, um, that that to me is somewhat of a slap in the face. So, I, I think that that's, you know, the, 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 some of these funding mechanisms aren't necessarily uh, even viable options. So, um, that, that to me is somewhat disconcerting as it relates to this plan. But um, I understand that they're just sort of throwing them out there. But the uh, and I understand this to be a sort of a practical uh, document. But what's the practical uh, idea around uh, getting the Walmart Foundation to fund uh, these uh, amenities? Do, do we have any idea of, of Walmart doing that in the past or? Walmart d does a lot of regional, I think is more that thinking as opposed to your city does or does not have a Walmart. That's my, what, what I understanding about why this would be put in there. That's a general possibility. It could be General Motors in there or whatever. It's more as a corporation versus a city. Some communities have successfully obtained funding from, from Walmart and some of these other sources. Um, whether it, whether that's a very likely source for Wheat Ridge, probably not. Um, but, it, but it is an option. We've received funding from Home Depot, and there's no Home Depot in our city. I do have a, 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 I'd like to mention something on page uh, 22, and what it's about is a uh, create a city bike map. I, I like that concept. I think that'd be valuable for both citizen riders as well as perhaps businesses close to those lists. Citizen riders here in the city as well as regional, those riders that are looking to make cross, cross city uh, <coughs> loops or rides, whatever. So I would really like to see that would be relatively inexpensive compared to some of the other things. I just, that's all. Um, if the council has no more questions, then uh, I do move on. Need we have a citizen who has sat and would like to speak to us on this. Thank you both very much, Scott, as well as Joe. Uh, Jenny, uh, Snell. No. Snell, no. yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Jenny Snell. I live at 7020 West 35th Avenue. Uh, that's S N E L L. Um, so I, I'm a resident of District One. I'm also an officer in the ADAP, the Active Transportation Advisory Team, and I also the Activate 38 coordinator for Local Works. That's a very recent development. I'm very happy to, to be a part of Local Works. Um, and I just wanted to, to just give some kudos. Um, I know that the Bike Pedestrian Master Plan is formally being adopted, and I want to take a moment to thank the Council and the Mayor for your vision, your forethought, and your hard work uh, to adopt this plan for our city. Um, with regards specifically to the Activate 38 project, which is a project that Local Works is taking on um, with a Kaiser Permanente grant, um, it's especially important for the Activate 38 corridor. Um, it is a community-led initiative to create, or I'm sorry, to increase use and improve safety for active transportation, transit, and wheelchair rolling along 38th Avenue, specifically between Kipling and Youngfield in Wheat Ridge. Users of this corridor include seniors, children, families, and business owners that live, work, and go to school in the area. Community members along this corridor are challenged with navigating the corridor if they are biking, walking, or wheelchair rolling because there are very few facilities for alternative transportation. This area is mentioned in the comments um, of the Bike Ped Master Plan, and adopting this plan for our city goes a long way to create a better transportation environment all of us. So thank you. Thank you for waiting all that time. <laughs> I believe we're ready for a motion, Mr. Pond. Okay. Now that I have myself completely in the wrong place in the document, 
I will produce a motion. Now I get it. I move to approve resolution number 25-2017, a resolution adopting the bicycle and pedestrian master plan. Second. Seconded by Ms. Hoppy. No, no, it was Ms. Duran. Ms. Duran. Oh, the Duran, the Duran one. I don't believe there's any more discussion, but yes, I see a finger up. I just want to make a couple of comments. Uh, in general, I want to thank staff and uh, the consultants and the citizens who participated in 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 the work, the um, in, the public input, and in getting to the plan. Um, I'm proud of what we've done over several years, and so I think to Mr. Urban's point, we've we've definitely invested some in our community, and I'm sure. Um, that we, you know that this plan lays out an opportunity for us to do to do more. I often commute across our city and at least two others as I come and go to work. And and I think um, you know I've noticed uh, uh, the evolution of the infrastructure um, throughout these these communities, and we need to continue you know to to continue to to do that to communicate to our neighbors neighbors and to invest in these facilities some of the ones that i ride in denver um once you kind of understand that you know you see the difference of a safe bike infrastructure specifically for and for that and i and i would say that a safe walking infrastructure again is is, is um something to to look at and i know most of you know what that feels like how important that is and and um and 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 what that does for you as a commuter or walker um, in terms of uh, peace of mind, mobility, the ability to to, to get around um, and uh, enjoy the amenities of our cities and our neighbors. Uh, it's very important. I hope we can continue to do it, but I just wanted to thank everyone for the work. I'm glad you said that because I noted that as well. The amount of public engagement on this project was huge, absolutely huge. I think you went to every resource you could to get that kind of engagement. And I, and we all appreciate it up there. It makes it easier for us to make this, for them, for the council to make this sort of decision and to accept the plan. Um, so thank you for that, as well as being at both pedestrian and bike. Both, both items, very good. I believe we can go to the vote now. No, there's more. We have another comment over here. Just very short comments. Thank you very much for the work. I'm, I'm really glad to see this plan. I'd like to... Uh, just to reiterate one comment about the uh, Activate 38 and the Kaiser Permanente grant. It's a study grant only and does not include any money for doing anything. Okay. Mr. Urban? You know, the, the things about plans is that they're nothing without action. And so as we look at this plan and, and, and we understand the purpose of this plan is to provide a, a practical plan towards action, uh, it, is, it is somewhat frustrating in the sense that as we you know, look at every inch of uh, the pedestrian and bicycle amenities that the city provides, uh, that those come at a cost and those costs have to be balanced against all the other uh, needs of the city. So uh, while I, I truly appreciate all of the efforts that the city has made to provide for those types of amenities within the city, at the same time we have to consider uh, the costs that those are balanced against and all the other uh, considerations that the city has as far as other costs. So as much as uh, this plan does a good job at identifying all the needs, and the needs are obviously great because the, the laundry list here is quite long as far as what we have left to do to make our city uh, bicycle and pedestrian friendly, even though it seems like we've done uh, quite a bit so far. Yeah, I think that uh, we can always do better in that regard, but it, as it relates to this plan, I think it, it gives us a good plan to move forward. Uh, that being said, I think that the more important plan that we need to stay focused on is that ADA transition plan because in my mind, uh, the ability to uh, traverse the city as it relates to those that uh, fall into the uh, ADA is, is more of a critical uh, infrastructure need than it is uh, those that are just sort of uh, in the sort of bicycle and pedestrian amenity uh, crowd, so to speak. So. Uh, as we look towards implementing the bicycle and pedestrian master plan, it does help those that uh, are uh, traversing our city in wheelchairs or who have access needs or who are otherwise um, immobile and, and need uh, these sort of pedestrian amenities to, 
to get around. Uh, we need to kind of understand that uh, there's sort of two camps here that uh, uh, access these facilities. There are those that are using our green belt in the Crown Jewel we are just sort of a recreation facility, but there are also those that need these types of facilities for uh, life and safety. So uh, there's sort of that balancing act as well. So we need to kind of keep those in mind as we go forward that there's that there's those two sides of this coin. But um, I'll be supporting this measure tonight. Can I call for the casting of the vote? Please do. <clears throat> Motion carries six to zero. That concludes the decisions portion of our meeting, the business meeting, and we can move on now to city manager's matters. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we're still very busy um, issuing um, roofing permits. Um, Mr. DiTullio, I believe, did you pass the report out already? Um, report, um, pass out our bi biweekly report on the number of permits and the revenues generated and, the, and this report is the first report that we're starting to track the uh, additional expenses so um, we'll keep that report up and, and I believe Mr. DeTulio is going to give you a summary of that. Um, we're seeing a slight uh, decrease in the number of submittals which I'm um, not sure if that's a temporary thing or, or um, if that's a, a sign but it's, it's, a, it's a good sign. I think we're getting caught up. Um, we have right now we have um, three um, uh, contract permit technicians on board they're working 10 plus hours a day to help us catch up um, the good news is we, we we may be making an offer this week um, to a permanent um, city staff permit tech that was been vacant so that will bring an additional person on and then we have one more contract permit tech coming back from vacation so we potentially may have four um, contract permit techs plus the two in-house contract or two in-house permit techs on board um, so hopefully that will help us catch up even more. We're hoping to get below um, a five-day turnaround here this week um, on um, issuing those. And um, as of last week, at the end of last week, we, we hit a high of 180 inspections a day. So um, that's decreased a little bit. We're doing about 150 inspections a day. So um, we still have enough, we have enough building inspectors to do that. We're meeting our next day um, inspections. There's been a few glitches here and there where there's been a few maybe some miscommunications, but I think our staff's been handling um, those. And um, and uh, with that, I will um, turn it over to Mr. Tulio to give a summary up on uh, the, our biweekly report. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, on the back of the report, as we talked about two weeks ago, this is the number of applications that have been submitted for roofing permits, not actually um, approved yet, but it's uh, 2,256 applications have been received since July, uh, Sunday, July 9th. And like I had mentioned uh, two weeks ago, the report is running every two weeks and the close of business, it ends on Sunday for us. And then this will be posted on the website. But as of um, ending July 9th, yesterday, we've uh, issued 2,285 permits. That's highlighted in yellow. And revenue is $991,165.90. So that's um, total revenue right now. But then, as Patrick mentioned, we've been able to add the cost at the bottom. And so the only really solid month of billing we have is June. So we had the two technicians at 352.5 hours, and they're, built, they're being billed at $65 an hour. And then we had six um, building inspectors, and that was 649 hours. So the totals, and then for the week of July 3rd, that's a guesstimate by the, pl the planning department for the week of July 3rd. So right now we're at about $104,000, $104,181.25 in costs. So um, I don't think we're going to be able to really have a projection on revenue and expenses until we have another one or two months in. I mean, today's July 10th, the storm was May 8th, so we got two months worth of data. We're probably getting the least couple more months to see where this tracks plus with winter coming some people may wait to pull permits next spring when um, they uh, pull it next spring because if their roof is not leaking um, so if you have any questions any questions on this or comments on the information so we'll be tracking the expenses now and like I had mentioned the billing is about a month behind so we just have we just paid June uh, for the and the contract company is at the bottom there. It's called Charles Abbott and Associates, and they're, I believe, they're based out of California. So, um, 
Um, I think the one thing that I've heard, and I think I have to agree with, you know, when I, when I was mayor, we discussed why the building inspectors didn't have a ladder on the truck. And um, maybe that made sense in normal times, but with 181 inspections, it's really not time, time efficient to take a ladder off a truck, put it on a house, take it off, and run to the next building. So I think if the contractors and the property owners just plan ahead and have that ladder waiting for their contra uh, for the building inspector to come, it can get done the same day that they're working on, at least for the mid-roof, and then they can come back and do the uh, final. But I think it really does make more sense right now to have the contractors putting the ladders on the roof and letting them uh, just get up and down and inspect and then go on to the next one with that kind of volume. Much more efficient. Right. Right. There may be an issue there with liability issues with the contractors. I know when they came out to check my roof, they didn't want me climbing it, and I realize I'm not supposedly a professional, but they said nobody gets to go on their ladder but them. So if we can do it, fine, but don't expect full cooperation. Well, I'm not saying that the, the homeowner goes up and inspects. It's... Oh, no, provides the ladder. What's that? The homeowner provides the ladder. The contractor okay. does. Okay. The contractor provides the ladder, so... Whereas the, the lie, people have asked, the liability falls with the contractor if somebody gets hurt, not the homeowner. Is that correct? Yeah, it's the, it's the homeowner and the contractor's site, you know, that we are visiting. You know, if there's a dangerous condition on that site, cause injury to us, it's not our fault for being there. Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Tulio, for providing this report. I really appreciate you keeping us up to date on what's happening as it relates to the numbers that are coming in. And, and uh, thank you to Patrick Goff and his team as it relates to processing the permits in a somewhat timely manner and getting those uh, going faster as they come forward. I appreciate that. As it, as it comes down to that 181 per day, do we, how many inspectors are doing that number or what's the volume of that know, was a high day so that's back down to 150 and, and we've been talking about that to make sure that we're not um, having too many inspections per inspector and and we I think that 180 we, that was with five inspectors um, and we're back down to about 150 right now on average so with five inspectors again so I think keeping below that 30 inspections per inspector is, is kind of our um, goal so that um, we're not so we're doing a, um, a thorough job and, and they're not rushing and and potentially um, causing any injuries for anybody um, and, and others. So that we're keeping a close eye on that. And um, Charles Abbott Associate um, has created a bench of additional inspectors. So if that if that in daily inspection rate gets to a point where we need more inspections, they'll have somebody ready. Okay. And then as far as the permit process is concerned, uh, the turnaround time is right now, what, what is that? We're right now, as of today, we're, we've gotten it down to um, about seven days of, of business days, and we think by the end of this, hopefully by the end of this week, we'll have turnaround down, down to five business days. So that's once somebody submits a, a online permit application, um, we it'll it's about five days before we can review that because we have a backlog of about we got it down to about 500 right now. So um, it takes us about um, seven days to, to catch up um, and again hopefully um, we're gonna get that down to 300 soon and we'll should be able to turn those around in less than five days my goal I told staff is to get that back to three to five days so was the that slowdown at all related to um, the holiday or was that uh... I think it might have been yeah so we're not the slowdown in, in the number of, of permits um, mm -hmm. applications submitted potentially um, so we're, we're gonna see if that's gonna go back up or not um, and again, if it if it does, um, we're going to have, as I mentioned um, in my summary, we're going to have um, uh, a few more on staff here in the next couple of days. So um, hopefully, we're, we're still going to we're still our goal is still to reach three to five day turnaround. Okay. So Thank right you. now we're at a five day turnaround. To receive right now we're at about seven day. We're hoping to get five by the end of the week, and hopefully at, our goal is to get um, three to five. That's permit. To receive the permit permit the actual inspection are you still on the we're still on next, next day. day as long next as they inspection. as long as they call or email um correctly and and give us the right address right. um that's uh, we, pretty impressive we do we do do next day inspections right. and i just want to say thank you to the staff as it relates to some of the inquiries that i've made that they've been able to uh, respond in a quick manner relative to those inquiries that i've made uh, with residents and roofers uh, that have had you know concerns relative to both the roofing permit process, but also the building permit process, because uh, obviously there's been some confusion 
both from the homeowner's perspective when they think their contractor has actually submitted a permit and actually haven't. So it's sort of trying to help both sides, you know, understand that, uh, that sometimes these uh, contractors are, are telling the homeowner one thing and uh, something else is actually happening. So it's helpful to kind of try to help people connect the dots. So thank you to the staff for a quick response. Okay. City attorneys matters. Nothing tonight. Thanks. has already spoken. I got something to say. You've already spoken. Yeah, I was, hopping with, else? I was hopping with Mr. Goff. Um, so I wanted to answer a question. I think it was either Mr. Matthews or Mr. Fitzgerald. As your treasurer, I can bring you the information and the dollar amounts, and this is unanticipated revenue. It doesn't mean we're in a windfall. It doesn't mean that we're not in a windfall because we also have lost a re retail store, Walmart. So does this information mean that the city is making a lot of money or not making a lot of money? It's too early to tell from my point of view as a your treasurer, but it gives you the information to inform your constituents. So um, like I said, if we have a few more months of this and we know that some of this revenue has made up the Walmart revenue and we're paying our bills, then, then we can, you know, the city manager can look at that when we're working on, your, on the budget coming up and then soon, but it's too early to tell where this is gonna continue or not. Uh, if it does, uh, that's fine, but it may, may go into next year also. So I just wanted to give you the information. I'm not necessarily saying it's a windfall or not. I'm calling it unanticipated revenue. Thank you for that. Mr. Doff, looked like you were getting ready. Nope, all right. Let's go through the city council. <laughs> Ms. Duran, I believe I said your name tonight. Yes, I wanted to know, um, Patrick, if you could give us an update on the Arapaho House. Sure. Um, I, I believe y'all got my email, correct? Mm -hmm. um, but we'll do an update for the public. Um, so the Jefferson Center for Mental Health did take over services, um, providing um, detox services from Arapaho House on June 26th. Um, if you drive by their building, you, you'll see they put a temporary sign up over Arapaho House. I think it says Jefferson Center Mental Health now. And um, we are um, working on um, finalizing an IJ, intergovernmental agreement, between Jefferson Center and all the cities that they're going to serve um, in the Jefferson County. Um, so that should be coming to City Council very soon. That that just um, dictates um, what the city, what the governmental part party's responsibilities are, basically funding, um, and then also what Jefferson Center's responsibilities are. Um, so that sh should come soon. Um, Rappo House was able, or Jefferson Center was able to negotiate a short-term lease um, from Rappo House. Rappo House does own that building, and um, that uh, just so that they could get in there. And their, their their intent is to purchase the building, so they're hoping in maybe after six months to have a negotiation with Rappo House to actually purchase the building. So, um, but I asked the police chief today if we've had any, if he, he heard of anything or heard any issues, and um, we haven't heard anything negative or positive either way of of of, um, of the transition. Sounds like um, transition went pretty smoothly so far. Yep. Thank you. Poppy, uh, Patrick, I also have a question for you. The uh, the balancing act that is the interactive piece for the community. Yes. Do you know when that will be available for people to go online and work with? You know, I, I don't think we put that up until we actually have um, a proposed budget, um, but let me check with um, Carly and Heather. They're working on that. We're planning to, um, I think as Heather mentioned earlier, have the proposed budget to you all right, bef right after Labor Day, right after, it'll be right before Labor Day, somewhere in there. So I think that's when um, then we actually enter those actual numbers into that system so that um, citizens can actually play with the actual numbers. So it should be up, um, hopefully that time same time frame around Labor Day. Great, thank you. Mr. Urban. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, for those that may be interested in the issue of uh, human trafficking, the Jefferson County Human Trafficking Subcommittee meeting is on June 19th from 11 to 1 p.m., and that's held in the di District Attorney's Office. And uh, the Colorado Human Trafficking Council meeting is on July 28th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, and that's at the Jefferson County Human Services Building as well. Thank you. Uh, nothing tonight. Thank you, ma'am. Nothing tonight. Mr. Matthews? No, thank you. Not tonight. Well, we're ready to close the meeting, but I've got 
six of you here. I need to know if you're going to parade in the, go in the Carnation Festival Parade. So get back to me soon or tonight. <laughs> it's really fun. You get to wave. You get to pass out candy. People are happy to see you. It's an obligation to our citizens to be there and say, this is your city elected officials. But don't feel bad if you don't come. You know, no pressure here. But your names will be announced. <laughs> All right, good night, everybody. Madam Mayor, could oh. you open up the meeting again? I have a few things to say. Let's reopen the meeting. Um, there's an election coming up, and um, I want some people have already um, turned in paperwork to run for office. I wanted to tell you there was an error on one of the candidates documentation that has been fixed. Um, Robin is um, at Institute this week and he's the one that accesses the website because I can't and um, <clears throat> so um, any new paperwork that comes in the rest of the week it it may not get up in quite as timely a fashion, but it'll be up as soon as possible. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to tell you that um, I will be gone on for the meeting of July 24th, and Robin will be um, filling in here. Um, and also, um, I'm planning to have a sort of a potential candidate information night um, in one of the first few days of August. The date isn't set for sure, so I'm not even going to say. But um, it, it won't be real candidate orientation. It's just going to be for people who, who might be interested. Um, I've asked a couple of the um, folks who have turned in paperwork if they would um, like information like that. It's not going to be real detailed a lot of just question, opportunities to ask questions, um, but I will go over the calendar and um, kind of tell them what it's like to be an elected official, um, what some of their commitments might be to, to know, um, what would be expected of them, and just sort of open it up for questions. And the whole, um, I'm sure since you all ran, uh, at some point after the, after the petitions are all in and we have um, a set of candidates, then we, we will also have the lot drawing and the um, kind of true candidate orientation, kind of go over the, the financial paperwork things that you have to fill out because that's a little, you don't want to do that unless you really have to. <laughs> Um, so I guess that's all and I won't be here for the 24th so enjoy that's all thank you thank you and I apologize and now I close the meeting again so we had two meetings